consider the ban. Microfinance institutions struggle to bounce back from the disruptions of COVID-19, reveals the latest rapid assessment by the Social Enterprise Development Partnerships, Inc., or SEDP. With us now for more is SEDP President Vincent Rapisura. Good to see you again, Vince. Welcome to the program. Hi, Kathy, and thanks for having me back. Sure. So how many microenterprises have since reopened following the strict lockdowns across the country? Yes, so we've, uh, we've noticed that uh, 9 out of 10 microenterprises are already open and back uh, to business. So this is a, a very good improvement from the lockdown period where we had a bottom of about only four, uh, 3 to 4 microenterprises out of 10 who are, uh, that were open. Uh, what, what's, what's good also, Cathy, is we observed improvement in the sales uh, of uh, these microenterprises. In fact, uh, last week, comparing uh, from uh, the last week of May and last week, Three times of uh, the, there were three there were three uh, three hundred times uh, increase no on uh, for micro enterprises that in, that improve that experience their uh, increase in sales and this increase in sales translated to better collection rates among microfinance institutions. Wow, that's really encouraging. Nine out of ten just bouncing back from yes. the pandemic. So, how important has the government assistance been? Because I see that it's it's top the list of the coping mechanisms. Yes. So uh, the coping mechanism at, at, at the top of the list is uh, um, almost all of our micro enterprises were able to get uh, relief goods, and eighty six percent were able to go, to receive cash assistance. And uh, the cash assistance actually gave a lot of elbow room for the micro enterprises to um, uh, fend for their uh, daily needs. And also, I think uh, some of this uh, fund were used to uh, restart their businesses, and that's why uh, cash assistance is really more preferred uh, because it's more uh, flexible for micro enterprises uh, compared to just uh, providing relief goods. Um, the other coping mechanisms that we also want to um, encourage actually is for micro enterprises to have more uh, uh, emergency savings and adequate insurance coverage. And microfinance institutions are at the forefront in providing this to them. And I see that the majority of them have since resumed the original repayment schedules, but I also yes. see that many have asked for an extension of the grace period. Yes, so um, about 70% uh, or uh, a, a little less than 80% have asked for uh, to resume their repayment schedule uh, using the original schedule, but they wanted to have uh, one month up to two months uh, extension of the grace period to give them time to cope and to give them time to, time to restart, uh, rebuild their uh, livelihood to be able to uh, repay their loans again. No? And uh, uh, if we compare actually the collection rates uh, from the microfinance institutions during the lockdown in April and May, uh, that's about 0 to 45 percent uh, for my, the microfinance industry, that's the collection rate. For the first week and second week of June, that went up to up to 77 and 80 uh, percent. But this is of course still a far cry from the pre-pandemic collection rate of microfinance institutions, which is at around 98 to 99 percent. And just to give you a benchmark, Kathy, for um, most microfinance institutions to break even, we need at least about 90% collection rates. So how soon do you think you're going to hit that? Because just looking at the first two weeks of June, it looks promising that the third week might, might get to 90%. Yes, yeah, uh, we're really hopeful that before June ends, we would be able to hit uh, 90 and uh, uh, 90 percent and above, and, and we really hope that it would continue um, uh, uh, until the year ends and uh, uh, so on after that. But uh, of course, what we are also uh, aware of and we're, what the, the risk here is for the fear of a second wave that might also again uh, result to lockdowns and uh, prohibiting microenterprises to operate their businesses. Right, it all depends on the lockdowns and the severity of it on, on whether we go back to it or not should a second round of infections occur. Just how is the government stimulus matching up to what the MFIs are in need of for the recovery? Because the government interventions have so far included uh, a couple of things. They, they include grants, uh, bridging yeah. loans, uh, loan yeah. program, and, and interest-free loans. Yes. So we, we took a look at the various bills um, that are uh, in Congress and in the Senate. And um, when we took a look at interventions from the government, the stimulus coming from the government, um, it would total about 245 billion pesos. But this would cover micro, small and medium enterprises. And what we found out would be um, the small and medium enterprises would actually 
uh, have a lion's share of this uh, uh, stimulus budget. Um, in our calculations, micro enterprises would need about 40 billion pesos uh, for a stimulus to be able to uh, bounce back properly and uh, to prevent them from becoming poorer. Uh, but uh, so far from this uh, stimulus package that we see from the government, there's about 10 billion from the Department of Trade and Industry as grants and 25 billion uh, for the uh, uh, small business corporation. And there's also 10 billion from uh, the Agricultural Credit Policy Council. But we feel that uh, most of these funds actually would go to small enterprises rather than uh, micro enterprises. And if you also observe, if you take a look at the strategy of the government in terms of stimulus, it is primarily a debt driven um, recovery. But what we really want uh, uh, actually is for more for an equity driven uh, recovery. And that's why we are calling for a 0% loans uh, to micro enterprises to allow them to recover and also uh, to for uh, for the government to actually come up with the IRR on the Islamic banking because that would allow um, equity based uh, recovery from this pandemic rather than the traditional conventional uh, debt driven and interest driven um, uh, uh, recovery or uh, financial problems. Could you give us a reason why it's so important that it's equity driven and not debt driven for MFIs? Yes, uh, because uh, in, in conventional finance, uh, interest is actually uh, the norm in uh, in uh, uh, equity in, in equity uh, uh, financing that would, there would be profit and loss sharing. And in this uh, situation that we have now, in terms of this pandemic, this crisis that we are uh, facing, if it's going to be a debt-driven uh, recovery, then the microfinance institutions will be at the sole receiving end of the losses. Uh, that would have that would uh, that would transpire uh, whereas if it's equity then there is profit and loss uh, sharing scheme and this is very much uh, already in our uh, law no? there's a law on that it's rd 11439 the islamic banking act and the universal banks could actually uh, put up uh, units uh, for uh, profit loss sharing financial products within their uh, within their financial products. Right. It, it makes it all the more inclusive uh, when you talk about Islamic banking. In terms of the recommendations, I see that uh, ease of access of documentation tops the list. Uh, a yes. lot of the red tape and bureaucracy is still getting in the way and worse in a pandemic. Yes, because uh, we, we found out that microenterprises, one of the barriers for microenterprises to access government services is really identity because access to government and uh, services starts with identity. And that's the reason why we want to start with uh, uh, a program that would hasten the um, access for government identification documents. In fact, we already, of, of course, we already have a law on this uh, again with the national ID system. And this should uh, this should be uh, fast tracked and uh, uh, implemented at the bottom of the pyramid uh, primarily, uh, because after the identity, then we could have a financial inclusion because it would be easier for the poor, the marginalized sectors, to open bank accounts, and that would make them uh, uh, that would make them give them the ability to access more government services and benefits. Just a final point, Vince. The House and the Senate are now seeking a compromise to the Bayanihan Part 2 bill. In, in what way do you see its passage helping the MFIs? Yeah, I think that um, the passage of the Bayanihan Act uh, sh uh, 2 should focus really more on providing uh, f funding for microfinance institutions that would really help microenterprises uh, recover and bounce back. And for us, that is through 0% um, interest, and because if we, if we provide interest, high interest rate to microenterprises, that would be increasing their burden um, in society. And uh, of course, also, uh, we think that uh, the budget should be increased. Now, it should not be just focused on the small and, uh, small and uh, medium enterprises, but to make sure that the bottom of the pyramid, the, mar the marginalized sectors, gain priority in access accessing these funds. Right, that's our goal, to get to everyone so that no one is left behind. Thank you so yeah. much for the update, Vince. You keep well, as always. Vince yeah, Lakisura of SETP. Now, with researchers around the world working on more than 200 vaccine candidates for COVID-19, the World Health Organization is hopeful hundreds of millions of doses will be produced this year. Here's the full story. 
World Health Organization hopes hundreds of millions of doses of coronavirus vaccine will be produced this year, should any currently in clinical trials.